my case is much cooler than Dimitri's. Uh, all right, let's have some fun here. Let me take you through the, the night this happened, and, and we'll stop it and start it and see what everyone would do here and how many times I made mistakes. So 1 AM, you get called. I get called that there is a gentleman that was minding his own business and got shot. Got shot in the back, was taken to an adult hospital. Uh, but because he was two months away from his 18th birthday, um, they transferred him to us. He actually had a CAT scan done, which showed evidence of a vena cable injury. Um, but he had a hematoma, so they transferred to us. And uh, he was stabilized, taken to the operating room. We did a uh, laparotomy. And uh, let me talk about what we found, and we'll stop it and see when people would have done things different. It should be audio with this. So the gunshot, I got my uh, medical student narrating, which may be more fun than me. But uh, so the gunshot goes through the spine, uh, through the cava, and then it does a uh, blowout injury of the duodenum. Ischemia, vena cava injury, and a duodenal injury. OK. So we packed off, got control, found the cable injury, got control of the cable bleeding. Now we have uh, a complete duodenal blowout at the second portion. So uh, when I say complete duodenal blowout, I mean two pieces. Who here would, I guess I'll take volunteers of ideas of what you would do. Who here would repair and close that and get out? One person. Uh, who here would do something else? Some sort, what would you do? What would people do? Well, you want to try to avoid the trauma whipple. So uh, one option in this case is, of course, to bring a, a loop of uh, jejunum up there and okay. try to use that as a patch or, or, or an onlay patch or a serosal patch. Who would do a jejunal patch? Okay, four or five. Yeah, yep. I guess in my, ex my experience in the Iraqi war with a lot of high, injury, uh, high energy duodenal injuries, we would always try to repair it and then try to, try to pr pr protect it in some way. How would you protect it? You can do a, uh, uh, you know, pyloric exclusion, uh, open the posterior stomach, over the pylorus, and then uh, do a gastro J. And then in some cases of really bad injuries, we would do retrograde duodenal drains. Okay, let me stop you. Don't, don't leave yet. Hold on. So who would do a pyloric exclusion? Who would do a pyloric exclusion the way you just described, where you do a gastrotomy and so close the pylorus with an absorbable suture? Okay, first, first who would put a stapler? Across, okay, now, and you put it across the pylorus, right? Okay. So that's what I did. Now, the two options were, the, those are the two options. I chose to do that because this patient, I've done both. Um, unfortunately, we've had to do, I've had to do too many of these. But I, I've done it where I've opened, sewn it close with a purse string with a pylorus with a vicryl, and then do a gastrojejunostomy or a G-tube and a J-tube. Uh, in this patient, he was, un, he was not stable. I wanted to get him off the table, so I did a staple just like you did. He was hemodynamically unstable because he had massive blood loss of over five liters from his vena cava injury. After addressing his hemorrhage by a pair of the vena cava, the patient underwent primary repair of the duodenal injury and stapled pyloric exclusion to ensure gastric contents did not interfere with duodenal repair. Pyloric exclusions are typically expected to open four to eight weeks post-surgery. A gastrostomy tube was inserted for gastric drainage and a jejunostomy tube was placed for feeding. However, five months after surgery, the pylorus still failed to reopen as expected, yeah. as seen on this upper GI. Damn it. So uh, five months later, it's still closed. Who would keep going, keep waiting? Who would intervene? It's five months out. His pyloric exclusion still hasn't opened. They're supposed to open. So I'm sorry. So who would intervene? OK. Who would wait? Wait a few more months, OK? In addition to not being able to eat, the patient suffered from malnutrition and electrolyte disturbances as a result of this complication. While other options to manage the gastric outlet obstruction Include pyloroplasty or gastrojejunostomy. Who would go in open 
to do an operation on this patient. Let's not say what it is yet. Who would do an open operation on this patient? Okay, reasonable, probably me too. Who would do a laparoscopic procedure on this patient? Who would do an endoscopic procedure? Jim, I knew you were gonna say yes to that, okay. So it's a, actually, I see almost a complete third, third, third split. Who would do, what would you guys do? Just curious. What would anyone do here? If you've got a gastric outlet obstruction, Jim, if you're gonna spoil my fun, I'm gonna be really upset. I'm not, I'm not gonna spoil your fun. Okay. I, I was just gonna say, I would evaluate it endoscopically. I mean, I think, okay. it, I don't think it, you know, you, you don't have to make any decisions, just go down and take a look. You don't have to, it's part of your evaluation, I would do a gastroscopy. Fair enough, we put an endoscope down, and not only is it, there's no opening, we can't even really tell where the staple line is. It's almost completely just a big sack. We cannot see any evidence of an outlet possibility opening. Okay, would anyone do uh, a pyloroplasty? Maybe, laparoscopic open pyloroplasty? All right, let's see what we did here. Here we describe the creation of the neopylorus using a bubble endoscope method. The G and J tube were removed oh. and a gastroscope and jejunoscope were inserted as illustrated in this diagram. A 9.8 millimeter gastroscope was inserted and herobrate through the mouth and into the stomach and an endoscope was then inserted retrograde through the J-tube site through the proximal duodenum. The closed pylorus was seen from both ends. Transillumination was achieved with each endoscope visualizing the other's light. Cannulization was first attempted with a blunt catheter unsuccessfully. Coloscopy was used to align the endoscopes. A 1.8 millimeter needle nut was then pushed through the membrane from distal to proximal with clear visualization from the contralateral side. A guide wire was passed through the needle and the needle was removed. A balloon dilation catheter was then passed over the wire and the neopylorus was sequentially dilated to a maximum of 10 millimeters. The patient's original G-tube and J-tube were removed and replaced with a gastrojejunostomy tube acting as a stent to ensure patency of the neopylorus. Distal endoscope was used to position the tube and the small bowel. Post-operative fluoroscopy and abdominal radiograph showed no evidence of leakage or pneumoperitoneum. Serial endoscopic dilations were performed every one to four weeks with a maximum balloon size of 18 millimeters to expand the pylorus and prevent restructuring. The patient recovered remarkably well. After the first follow-up endoscopic dilation, he was eating a regular diet and had no retained food products in the stomach. He was no longer reliant on his GJ tube for drainage or feeding. At the latest endoscopy, pylorus was entirely mucosalized and widely taken. Here we presented a rare complication of pyloric exclusion and an innovative approach to use double endoscopy and serial endoscopic. All right. Thank you. Any questions about that?